Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to this week's Productive Agent Podcast. My name is Tony Ruiz, and I'm the founder and host of the Productive Agent Podcast and Facebook group. And today I'm joined by my good friend, Mr. Austin Riley of State Farm Insurance. How are you doing, man? Doing good. Hopefully I can be a productive agent for you today. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to crush it. <laughs> See, we're already off to a great start. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's been a while since we've like, this is probably going to be the most time we've spent together just talking. You In know? a minute, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been a minute. But uh, we met back at Churchill. When did you graduate? Dude, we met at Bradley. We did meet at Bradley. Oh, yeah, man. We go back that's a way solid back. 25 years, I yeah, think, so, if you want to so do the math. I'm 39. What are you? I'm 37. So I was a couple years behind you, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You didn't I, see me a lot because I got sent to the stairs, you know, with all the other drummers. You know? <laughs> Mr. Geimer. Yeah. yeah Sending people right. to the stairs. That's yeah. Right. Rest in peace. <laughs> yeah, that's but right, yeah, man. Yeah. That's, wow. I didn't realize that. You yeah. know, I, I, I obviously knew your family. Like, my first year teaching at Churchill was your family's last year yeah. with Ellen. Yeah. And um, so how's your family doing? Yeah, mom and dad are doing great. They're doing their thing. Uh, my sister just had her first child. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so we've been we've been celebrating that for a good minute, but she lives up in the Pacific Northwest now. So, okay. uh, you know, just getting pictures and, and videos and, and yeah. that sort of thing. So looking forward to, you know, meeting the baby here later this year. How old is the baby right now? Three months, maybe oh, wow. two months. Wow. Yeah, she's she's okay. fresh. I should know that better. <laughs> Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> it's all good. Right on. And you have uh, two kids, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. D tell me about them. Got two little monsters. I got a seven year old and a uh, a four year old little boy. Seven year old little girl. Four year old little boy. Spencer and Graham. Cool. Um, they keep us active all the time. We're just starting to get into like the extracurriculars. Yeah. Man, I we're like tip of the iceberg stuff right now, and I'm already losing sleep. So we'll we'll stay busy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a lot, you know. And it, you just feel like the chauffeur when yeah. you're just running people around yeah. constantly. Yeah, how do you stay focused on this stuff? <laughs> you know what I mean? For sure, it could be it could be a distraction, but it's a good distraction. That's for right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. Well, right on, man. Um, let's get into talking about insurance. So last week we talked uh, with Caroline Daly um, with Fidelity national home warranty mm -hmm. right and we we're talking about the difference between home warranty home insurance and what her product offers and all yeah. that um and we touched base a while ago and just we're reconnecting and i was like you know what it'd be great to have somebody to talk about home insurance auto insurance your business here um so you can share with your people i can share yeah. with my people and we can just kind of cross pollinate yeah right? sounds great cool man right on <clears throat> So uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, how long you've been in the insurance business Oof. and uh, what got you into the business? So 15 years ago now, I was teaching band. Can you relate? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was teaching band and um, while I, I enjoyed the activity and the kids were great, I didn't enjoy the work like I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, relocate, wanted to, you know, have a family. And I knew some of the challenges that went with that vocation so i didn't know what to do honestly i, I had bills to pay mm -hmm. and so i called my state farm agent you know <laughs> i had done a uh, uh, an internship in college with northwestern mutual so i'd already had some licensing knocked out which made me valuable in that that recruiting market so um, long story short i went to go work for uh, a state farm agent up in valley ranch texas down the street from the cowboys um <laughs> And I worked as a production team member for six months, you know, uh, with, without any sort of like, okay, like this is what I'm going to do, right? Um, and it really didn't start off that great. You know, it took me some time to develop the skills needed to have some iota of success doing that. But I think what really resonated for me was seeing how he spent his time. You know, he ran what I thought was a humble business and did a great job doing it, but you know, I, I'd always see myself, you know, CEO, corporation, blah, 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 like bigger and better stuff, investment banker, all the, all the stuff. And, um, you know, and, and then I got to see where he lived in the nicest part of Dallas, how his family um, got to spend time. And he was always there. He was always there for his family. Um, when I was in college, I realized how much of a luxury that is for people to be able to participate with their kids. My parents did that. They were very involved with me and my sister and all of our extracurricular activities. And I took that for granted thinking, you know, everyone's got this. So um, that is not the case. And yet I wanted to make that the way it was for my kids that, 
you know, hadn't even come into the world yet. So when I saw that he was able to provide that, I kind of just put my blinders on and said, okay, how do I do that? Sure. You know, maybe I, I, I end up there. Maybe it opens up other doors that I'm not aware of yet. Um, but that's where I decided to go because I also it really appealed to me to be my own boss mm-hmm. um, and, and to be able to make all those decisions myself and, um, and, and have it all resting on my shoulders. I was used to that already. So, you know, can I, can I do that in a different way? Yeah. So, you know, I, I started going down that road and became a corporate sales trainer for State Farm, um, which relocated me back down here to San Antonio and got me in touch with the right people uh, to... Uh, know uh, who could instruct me on when it was time to jump into agency, which was 2014 at this point. So now we've been going, uh, doing this now for eight years, working on year nine. Um, pardon me, working on year 10 uh, in 2024. So uh, that's a, a, a quick summation yeah. of 15 <laughs> years of work, but that's the majority of it has been in agency <clears throat> in the business owner role. Yeah. Um, and, and then um, a little bit of team member work and a little bit of corporate sales training. Okay. Well, cool. Um, how did you end up at State Farm? I mean, there's so many different insurance businesses. What drew you in? I'm guessing that's kind of where you started and you just stayed in track there. I, I like to say I had an open mind to that type of stuff. You know, like I, uh, <laughs> I like to tell the story that literally the day they were putting up my, my signage here, um, <laughs> I met with an independent agency broker that was trying to, to poach me away from State Farm like on day one, you know. So, um, you know, I, I, I drink all my red Kool-Aid with State Farm. My family <laughs> has used State Farm prior to. Yeah. Um, I leaned on our State Farm agent to secure my, my first position. But um, I also did a little bit of independent research when I decided I wanted to be a business owner. Like, like okay. I drink all this Kool-Aid, but I need to understand the comp structures for the other organizations so that I never feel like I didn't do the best thing for my family. And upon further research, it didn't change my mind. It just reinforced my decision to continue down the path with State Farm versus being an independent agent or working for one of the other major carriers in an agency position like this. Sure, sure. Well, cool. Um, What would you say is your favorite thing about doing insurance business? You know, seeing and hearing people thank me for helping them solve problems they didn't know how to solve. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know if you were expecting that type of answer, but my favorite thing to do in this business, my, my favorite thing, my favorite activity to do is to meet with my customers for a simple conversation it is our branded um, thing here at State Farm. where We're going to have a simple conversation, figure out what's important to you, challenges you guys facing and what can I do what products do we have at our disposal to help solve those problems yeah you know and and when we execute that conversation the right way (laughs) having someone thank you for scheduling an insurance financial services (laughs) review you know what I mean it just (laughs) it, it seems counterintuitive but if I do it right that's the type of response I get so that's my favorite thing is helping my customers solve those problems my, uh, my near second is seeing my team members hit their goals and seeing the fulfillment that they get out of that. Mm. Take it real seriously that um, I'm not just putting food on my family's table. Yeah. You know what I mean? The decisions I make and the way that we do what we do in here puts food on all my team members' families' uh, tables as well. You know, So um, seeing them do well is also very gratifying and fulfilling for me along with helping customers, yeah. I just got a little goosebumps, honestly, because because uh, it makes me think of education. I mean, that's truly what we are at, at the core of what we're doing. Yeah, right? ironic. You know, we do you it know? on this side of the fence, but it's like the same thing. You know? Yeah. I mean, you're educating people about the insurance, and that's what this whole podcast is going to be about because there's a lot of stuff. That <laughs> I have no idea what's going on with insurance. I want to learn. Yeah, <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, yeah. these people want to learn. Yeah. You know, so you're going to help us educate you're going to help educate us of what that is, yeah. you know? So um, it's cool. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that, man. For sure. You know, we skipped over it, but I got to mention it because people are going, well, this is a different setup if you're watching on YouTube here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so important it is so that, important. that, that yeah. I, I want to get back to this yeah. before we dive into the, the fun stuff of insurance, right? But your setup of Legos, 
I said you probably have more Legos in this office than they yeah. have at the Lego store. Yeah, you, you can't even see all of it right here. Right? And this, <laughs> this is like some of my favorite stuff, but like there's there's rooms of it. Um, well, it, what, what what where did that what, what happened? I, I what, love what it. happened to you. What what <laughs> happened? This looks like a like a life changing event here. Um, it's super cool. It, it was man. It was a life changing event. I. Um, I was seeking some professional development. We were five years into the business, maybe four years into the business. And I don't know, um, how long have you been doing it? You've been in it four uh, or five years? Five now? years, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I don't know if you felt this way around like year four or five, but it was sort of like expletive filled. It should be better by now, mm. you know? Um, I should <laughs> wow. be able to bring home more money at this you're, point. You're so, speaking to me. Okay. So it, yeah. it, it kind of came from this like this place of like professional frustration, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I seeked out some business coaching. Mm -hmm. So that's funny because I'm kind of in the same boat right now. I, I'm been talking to some different coaches and all that. It's yeah. off and on, it's off and on, and it's an investment <clears throat> in yourself, right? So I decided to spend that money and man, it was like the best thing I ever did. Mm. And I've done it like two or three times since with different coaches too, just to kind of like, you know, refresh the juices. Yeah. But this first guy, he asked me, um, what do you do? to reboot your brain, you know, whether you're upset or maybe you're not upset, maybe you're happy and you're just, you know, being your same flighty flaky self and you need to like <laughs> reel it in. Right. What do you yeah. do for 10 minutes? And he, he goes on to like describe what he does. You know, he lives out in the boons and uh, you know, he takes out a, his handgun and he takes out his frustration on like a poor defenseless tree stump or a cactus. And he's like, man, I could have had the worst conversation 10 minutes ago. Now I feel like a new person. It's like, Okay, like that that story resonated with me. I was like, okay, how do I figure this out? So, yeah, you know, I went back to my my music and I got my drumsticks out and I got my drum pad. I'm like, this should be it, right? This should be the thing. Nah, man, I could think while I drum. I, psh, nothing turns off. Nothing. I'm just doing stuff with my hands. Like it's, the drumming doesn't That's take away second like, nature. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I think I busted out like a Rubik's cube, thinking, like, nah, this is stupid. <laughs> and so my mom had gotten me like an off brand Lego thing for Christmas for the spurs or something like a stocking stuffer. So I was like, ah, whatever. And you know, let's try this dude. It, it was it. It was it like 10 minutes at a time, tedious, mindless step-by-step -step stuff like that. Like it, it turned my brain off and I've, I've kind of like thought a lot about it and why it's resonated so much, uh, in, in the past several years. But I think it's just being submissive to instructions and not being type A, not making decisions. I'm not, this isn't me. I'm, I'm following instructions here. Mm -hmm. I'm not Lego master. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is yeah. step uh, one, step two, step three. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The submissive part of my life. You know? <laughs> um, and I was like, Oh, okay. This is, this could be it. So I, I just kept doing it, you know? And, and once I finished that kit, I, uh, I was like, ah, I'm going to try like a traditional Lego kit. We'll see how it goes. And so, um, I bought one of these landscapes and uh which one was your first chicago chicago i thought it was appropriate you know bloomington illinois is yeah. state farms like home base okay so right. you, yeah, know, yeah. you know chicago whatever <laughs> i guess that's that was what i was thinking who knows um but man I, I picked my head up like two hours into it yeah and i was like man i think i'm almost done building this i can't do this at work this isn't a 10 minute activity anymore you know yeah. and so um that started what has been a consistent part of my life for five years now. Like I, I talked to my wife about it. Like there's a part of the Island in the kitchen that always has Legos on it at all times. Um, and so it's, it's been kind of a shtick yeah. that I've steered into, you know, at, at events, I'll bring Legos for the kids to play with now. You know, I yeah. got a, yeah. like a Lego license plate on the back of my car. It's like, what's your purple cow, right? Well, <laughs> you know, whether I like it or not, this has kind of turned into it, you know, and yeah. it's something that we can use for business purposes. But at its core, it's, it's, it's a way for me to turn my brain off mm -hmm. and to reboot my system on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Your kids like it? They're not as into it as I am, okay. but they're starting to get to that age where they, they can like focus long enough yeah. to get through it. Yeah, seven and four year old. Yeah, yeah. They like playing with them. They like breaking them. I mean, yeah. that's fine. They're sure. good at that. Yeah. It's I don't think they're <laughs> patient enough to like actually complete a set just yet, but they're getting closer. They're getting closer. All right. Yeah. Well, which one's your favorite? So Chicago is your first. Do you have a favorite? So I'm guessing it's at home. <sighs> Probably my favorites are up here. Okay. Because my favorites normally correlate with the ones that my wife doesn't want to see at the house. <laughs> um, 
anything Batman is probably my favorite, you know? So, like, if you're looking at this, the Tumblr has to be, like, it's my favorite movie of all time. So, this should be my favorite Lego, I I, I guess. But there are a bunch of cool builds that I like for different reasons. But, you know, that's getting a little bit too down the dork tunnel here. But (laughs) I'll say say my Batman builds are my favorite. (laughs) I like it. What's your favorite Batman movie? Dark Knight, easy, Ab- absolutely favorite movie yeah. of all time. Yeah. Period. Like, yeah, like so I, I, I can't really talk about any other movie before that one, <laughs> superhero or otherwise. You know, yeah. love Christopher Nolan. Yeah, uh, that was a great one for sure. <laughs> all right, guys, we we have to get that out of the yeah, way. Yeah, it, yeah. It's great. It's super cool. I want to go buy some Legos now <laughs> and start my own collection. <laughs> but uh, let's get back to insurance. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about your business here. Um, what kind of products and services do you offer to yeah. the client customer? I always joke, you know, being a State Farm agent is like an ADD salesperson's dream. I think we have like over a hundred products at our disposal here. Yeah. And and to be able to sell, you know, like if, if you look at the State Farm logo, um, the trioval stands for auto fire and life. Those are our core products. Um, but we're very needs based up here. We also have health insurance and disability products. Um, you know, we're also an advisory firm now f- to help people save for retirement. Um, I think there is a window, uh, you know, if you're if you're talking to uh, some of the big advisory firms or stockbrokers, you know, they, they kind of have a pay to play. You better be coming in with a boatload of money or else you can't have that that advisory relationship or you got to go to a Charles Schwab or like an Edward Jones. So State Farm um, has been working on getting us to carve out our niche in that that window as well. So, you know, we we do a little bit of that as well. Um, I'm licensed, uh, you know, not just to sell property and casualty product, but life and health, as well as um, variable retirement products to help people with saving for retirement and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> we also do home mortgages. You know, I think that's probably an appropriate thing to bring up uh, in this particular podcast. But I am a mortgage originator for Rocket. Um, and that is a relationship that State Farm set up. Uh, so I, I do it with State Farm's blessing. Uh, and we also have a relationship with U.S. Bank. Um, we'll help people with basic banking needs as well as uh, commercial funding for business owners like us um, through U.S. Bank and something called Lightstream. So State Farm's constantly working on that, right? Like, like are we the best ones to provide that product and service? Or should we saddle up with the industry leaders for this, that, or the other type of product, i.e. Rocket or U.S. Bank or the advisory services that we that we have access to as well? So um, what products do we do? Man, every everything, insurance it's, and financial services, but yeah. all that to say we're very needs-based with the way that we handle selling these products. You know, I, I, don't, I don't really come in with an agenda um, in those conversations where we talk about what's important to people, but... From there, once we identify, okay, here's here's a puzzle to solve. Here's here's how are we going to save for retirement on this income when we're living paycheck to paycheck in the inflationary environment that we're in? Okay, mm-hmm. like well, that's that's where it's at. It's it's a combination of things that we have at our disposal, and we'll probably meet again in a couple of years, and you know, move ninety degrees down another direction depending on what life throws at you, right? So, almost a hundred products that that we can sell somebody based on their needs, their specific needs. Yeah. So you just sit down and pretty much have conversation of going, where are you at? Where yeah. do you want to be? You know, how are we going to get there? I recommend this product, this product, this yeah. product. Yeah, it, it's not a one size fits all. You know, yeah. I, I think people know that we do home and auto insurance, right? We're also the largest life insurance company because um, we leverage that home and auto and the relationships that we've had for now 101 years, you know? Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, we can have that type of conversation without like pushing product, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and, and then it helps us expand that relationship with existing customers. And you know, now it's sort of a way to talk to new people that well, I got my auto and home somewhere else. But, you know, we don't have someone who can talk to us about this. Like, oh, cool. Let's go. Yeah. There's pretty much no insurance that y'all don't do. Is there? You know. There are some areas, yeah, I don't know how State Farm would feel about this. Sorry, State <laughs> Farm. Um, you know, like like Medicare supplement. Okay. You know, I think um, we have a couple of good solutions for that. <coughs> um, but it's not something I personally am super well-versed in. Um, and also uh, major medical insurance. We have 
solutions for that with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas. And we do sell that. Um, but I found here in this community that um, I can I can work with the other people that that's all they do, you know, all the time. And I, I think that provides more value to my customers than me trying to, you know, fake my way through, you know, seven major medical plans a year and act like I've like, like the industry leader in that. Right. Like, right. right. So, um, you know, sorry, State Farm, but um, there are some things that I'm more than happy to uh, lean on the other professionals in the community that do it every day. Yeah. And say here, help my customer with this, please. You know, right. Give them that referral. Give them that recommendation. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Law of reciprocity. I, I say that wrong. I'm <laughs> some uh, professional I keep on, reciprocation the, there there it is yeah, okay. uh, i and it's not just i'm clearing my throat because i have some junk in my throat but sorry about that yeah this is um, where we live now but um that's cool so let's get into a little bit more of the home insurance side of things yeah. you know going to a real estate side of things um what type of coverage do we need what type of coverage do we recommend kind of give us an overview of uh, what we need to be thinking about. Uh, let's start with from like coming from a real estate agent. Yeah. Hey, we just got in a contract for this build. You know, it's a pre-owned home. Um, where should we start getting quotes and stuff like that? So I'll go back a little bit and then and answer that. So okay. the home insurance product that we have in Texas with State Farm was one of the big reasons I decided to be a State Farm agent and not one of the competitors. Um Back in the early 2000s, you know, there was this big lawsuit that went down in Dripping Springs. It had to do with black mold. Some people remember it. Um, if you owned a home back then, there was probably someone knocking on your door from Timbuktu or Connecticut saying, hey, we're going to give you a free quote for repairs to your kitchen or your bathroom. You didn't even know you had damage to your kitchen or your bathroom. But you did because they knew if there was even an inkling of black mold, new kitchen new bathroom because all of the insurance contracts at that time were all risk contracts meaning if we didn't specifically exclude something the bias is given to the policyholder okay mm -hmm. and we all had the same type of product it was it was not all that different from auto insurance in that like from company to company the differentiation was who you worked with the claims performance did they give you hassles at like claims time or not right um and so, you know, when when this happened, everyone had to make their bed because it could have bankrupted the home insurance market in Texas. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of carriers that pulled out of Texas completely. OK, so everyone had to make their bed a little bit differently. And State Farm decided to keep the integrity of the all risk policy and add some mold exclusions. OK, so that that wouldn't happen ever again. But State Farm had to take, um, you know, I, I may be screwing up the actual numbers, but I think it was over a billion dollars. Uh, from auto company to pay out those claims, okay? Um, so we were a little bit restricted in Texas for five years, but then we came back and we opened up our same all-risk policy with those exclusions. Now, our competitors had to make their bet a different way. They decided to gut their quality out. So instead of having an all-risk policy, now they have named peril policies that they're selling to try to recoup that money by not paying out claims. Right. Because a name peril policy is a very strict, here's a list of what we'll pay for, nothing else. The bias is given to the insurance carrier. But I think consumers were fine with that because it also came with like a 50% off deal. You know, right, it's like right, instead right. of it's you cheaper. taking a rate, yeah, it, was, yeah, yeah. it was substantially cheaper. Yeah. But I don't, yeah. I don't think, you know, a lot of the sales agents and servicing agents out there did a good job of letting people know what you're giving up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know. The entire time I've been in this business, we've been more expensive for home insurance, but that really hasn't put a dent in our numbers because we've done a good job of telling that story, telling the story about why all risk is what you want for the most valuable asset on your balance sheet. You know what I mean? Like if something happens to that house and the insurance company's like, see, we're not going to pay off for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that, that's a, that's a big problem, you know, and yeah. um, to say the least now, we're 20 years, 25 years removed from that. And you're starting to see the major carriers get back to all risk policies. So like that gap in coverage from one company to the next to State Farm's policy has has narrowed, uh, which is probably a good thing for everyone in Texas. But um, 
you know, the home insurance product is still a little bit different from company to company. And outside of just looking at your declarations pages and the coverage amounts, you need to look at the legal writing and see what's excluded, what's not covered, what endorsements can you add that may be specific to the way you live your life that, you know, your neighbor next door wouldn't need. You know, are you a business owner? Do you run business from your house? Um, you know, all these types of things might play into how you want to build out your insurance contract, whether that be with a state farm all risk or another all risk somewhere else or a name peril. I, I mean, I, I don't want to say one is better than the other because you have this risk reward trade off, right? Mm. You as a consumer, the only person equipped to be able to decide what your risk tolerance is, how much am I willing to pay for this protection that I may or may not ever use, right? That ain't lost on me. And I, I always joke with my customers. I'm like, look, I'm a consumer too. And I don't like spending money on stuff that I don't feel like I'm getting any value from. Yeah. Well, that's, that's our job here in the agency to discuss why it makes sense to spend that money on this home insurance product. So anyway, um, you know, back to what should you be looking at? The big two types of policies are all risk versus name peril. I think most people that are listening to this podcast would agree that all risk is what protects their home the best. Now, there are a lot of options for all risk now, and then you can decide from carrier to carrier who wants your business the most because you know insurance pricing these days is not in a rate book anymore. You know, I used to be able to tell you 15 years ago why your rate went up to the penny. You know what I mean? It, because of this happened and then this happened. And see, I did the math and that's why your rate is this. Cool? Cool. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Not now, man. You know, the uh, the progressives, the Geico's, the state farms, the all states. I mean, back in the early 2000s, everyone was trying to figure out how to price our product correctly um, in today's world with cell phones and, you know, like, gosh, claims have gone up. The cost of the claims have gone up. Like, how do we price our product such that we can turn a profit and so now, you know, they, they go and pluck someone from Brown or Harvard, you know, or Yale to come up with an algorithm that, that <laughs> says, okay, Tony, you're going to pay this. You could live in the same house. You could drive the same car, be the same age. But this person over here, based on these thousand variables, is going to pay this. It's not, you know, there's nothing in a rate book anymore, right? So once again, it's not lost on me that sometimes State Farm has their own algorithm that spits out a rate may not make sense for the person that I'm talking to, you know? Um, so same thing, you know, some, some carriers have a certain uh, demographic that they're trying to sell to and they, they ain't going to give us the secret sauce. They just expect us to carry out the same fact finding mission and process. And to me, you know, I, I don't lose any sleep over when we can write business or when we can, or we price ourselves out because for me, I've been with State Farm now for 15 years. I've already seen the cycles come and go of, okay, now we're a little bit tight with underwriting. Oh, we're a little bit open with underwriting. Like it's a matter of time before the stars align with making a prospect a customer if we continue to have that conversation, you know, every six, 12 months and make it a pleasant one that, you know, they don't just dread, you know, like, like it's, you know, yeah. eventually something's going to happen with their own carrier where it's like, okay, we're going to switch, right? Right. Um, and I think the reason that that's okay is because the quality of that home product, you know, quality of the auto insurance, uh, you know, paying out claims, that performance, they always give me a leg to stand on corporately to where all I have to do is talk to you about what you need and say, this is my suggestion. This is, I think will solve those problems for you and be affordable. What yeah. do you think? Not this year. Hey, thank you for the opportunity. We'll reach back out again next year. Right. So, you know, I, I talked about the quality, the all risk versus name peril, but I think the relationship that you have with your agent, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like, do you want a relationship with your agent? Do you want a call center? Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, says, eh, it's not that big of a deal until it is a big deal. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like yeah. everyone hates attorneys until they need one. Right. Like, yeah. it's just like, sorry, attorneys, but insurance agents are like right there on the pecking order of like, <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. but if you have somebody that you can talk to that that knows what you go through that knows your life that kept good notes about those conversations mm. they can kind of guide you through these once or twice or three times in a lifetime days that you really need some backup on right yeah. you spend a lifetime of money on home insurance for one or two bad days yeah and it's an entirely profitable 
proposition. You may spend eighty thousand dollars, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in your life on insurance, but you know, you pay out like four roofs, and it's like, well, that was like four hundred thousand dollars worth of home repairs that I only paid one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for. Okay, well, like I'll take that. That sounds good. Yeah, but it doesn't feel great in the middle of it, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. It only looks good in arrears. So. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> yeah, you, you probably get that cringe look when mm -hmm. people are like, hey, we're just having a conversation here, yeah. seeing how I could help. Oh, I try not to like look at pricing at all. We're just, yeah, talking, yeah. About, we're just talking about the coverage itself. We'll let the pricing sticker shot come out later. So let, let's talk about that, yeah. if you don't mind. Is yeah. uh, Next question on, on the list is, you know, what is an average cost right now? Um, that's, uh, and I think about like a monthly mortgage payment, right? So yeah. like when I'm calculating something, mm -hmm. that's going to give us good solid coverage, but not going to like break the bank. How much should we be budgeting as agents and going, yeah. hey, your insurance is going to cost you about this per month? You know, I, I used to tell people about a hundred bucks a month, give or take. Like yeah. that's a pretty good standard and, and you know some people like eyeballs at me like i'm paying 50 bucks a month right now with competitor a right so, do you feel good about that like is that is that what you think you ought to be spending well, well, to protect your most valuable asset like what is that threshold right yeah yeah well what is it covering what yeah we'll talk a little bit about that and then you know? and then we can kind of dig in and like you know take a yeah. look at that and once again i'm coming from a place of like high quality high price right and yeah. i can gut mine down a little bit if these things aren't important to you but i would rather start with like the integrity product before we start like like stripping things down so you can see what you're giving up you know what i mean now that varies depending on the price of the home right yeah um, obviously I, like less on the price of the home more on the age of the home age of them because okay. you know, let me give you kind of like my basis on that so we moved out of a um like a median sized home here in san antonio if you look at like the average market cost of home here in san antonio that's where we lived right and I think we were paying pretty close to like $2,000 a year on home insurance, right? It's a 35-year-old house that we were living in. You know, probably, what was it? I think it was like 2,000 square feet, maybe a little bit less than that. A year ago, we moved into a new build, double the median-sized home in terms of mortgage market cost, paid the same amount of premium. Mm. So it has less to do with the dollar amount we're covering on the house, more to do with the age of the home. And do we think there are going to be claims in the future? Well, yeah. you know, like you were talking about last week, you met with the home warranty person, right? Like everyone has a home warranty for at least the first year, probably the first two. Right. Like new homes, you don't file a lot of claims on new homes. You can find $800 a year, $1,000 a year, and it'd be an all-risk policy, right? Because it's a new house that probably won't suffer any claims right and the way that they're building homes now makes it you know a little bit more affordable for the insurance as well so the older the home the more likely you're going to have to file a claim um and so you know the premiums on older homes tend to be proportionately more than the premiums on newer homes okay well how about the consumer or client out there that's been in their home 10 years well 20 years whatever yeah. they've had the same mortgage, you know, yeah. insurance, they've had that. <clears throat> should they be shopping around? Should uh, How often should people shop around? Um, is there going to be a big price difference if they do shop around? Um, and could it save them money on their mortgage? For sure. For <laughs> sure. Like, like I, man, what, what are the, the, the should commentaries? Like, let me say this. So shopping around is something that insurance carriers – on one side of the fence support <laughs> from a production right. side, but sure. on the other side, we don't want you shopping around. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I think, I think if you, if you're going to switch carriers that you should stay put for two to five years, you should, you should sleep in that bed that you made and stay put because part of that secret sauce algorithm, right? Like if you shop, that's okay. But if you don't stay anywhere for more than a year or for six months and you're shopping around from renewal, renewal, I think, people who are insured with independent agencies run into what I'm about to say. The secret sauce in our algorithm, I mean, like we need, State Farm has told us we need to keep customer for about two years to turn a profit on that based on, you know, the way all of our money works, right? Right. So what if you, you don't stay anywhere for two years? Do you think that you're going to get like the best price that you could be getting? 
Mm. I mean, probably not, right? Because they already know you're probably out in six months. So we're going to try to get a little bit more now. Like that is a part of it. You know, call it good or bad or for right or for wrong. So shopping itself doesn't necessarily create that problem for you. If you switch habitually, you know, okay. Now, to answer that question again, you know, I, I think you should shop if you're feeling some sort of way with your insurance carrier. You should shop it, yeah. you know, or you should talk to your agent or both. You know, I, I've even told some of my customers to shop because it's like, look, you don't know how good you have it. <laughs> you know, you, you, I, I know that you've been with State Farm for 25 years plus and you've never seen rate increases like you've seen this year. I get that. I understand that. It's not you, though. Right. Right. And sometimes it's like, go see what it looks like on the other side of the fence. Like, I care about you as a person. If you are able to find a better deal that's better for your family, I'll tell you what you're giving up if you're giving anything up. But like I said, the gap has closed yeah. in, uh, in in performance of contracts. So, like, if I got to, like, shake your hand and say thank you for your business, I'll call you back in six months. I'll call you back in 12 months because I'm gambling that, you know, my higher-ups will do a better job with the macro management of the business than my competitors. So it's really just a matter of time before I'm able to bring you back. Yeah. So, you know, how often should you shop? I don't know. As often as you feel frustrated with your insurance carrier, not being able to give you the answers that make you feel satisfied with whatever is going on, price increase, bad claims experience, billing confusion, whatever, right? Um, I tell people, I can't promise perfection. I wouldn't. But responsiveness, accountability, transparency when we make mistakes like these are things that we can do right and if that syncs up with you being able to you know deal with that with your insurance agency that's not perfect you know no. go go find one of the perfect ones i you know you you get my blessing you know what i mean <laughs> but um i think we've grown as a result of that that attitude that like we're people helping people not a company selling product you know what i mean yeah i love that people helping people Amen. What a novel idea. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so talk to us a little bit about uh, what's covered, what's not covered. What are some crazy stories that you've come across and like frustration and like on the good side of things? Like, well, what are, yeah. th what are some things that people think should be covered that aren't typically covered? Dude, here's one for you. Like, who do you think would pay for, like, let's say you have a bad tree on your side of the fence and it falls into your neighbor's house. Your insurance would pay for that, right? Like, like a car policy, like you're at fault. Like, like you have to pay for that, right? Yeah. I, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that crazy? It fell into their yard. So they're supposed to pay for it. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Because That's the crazy. tree fell as an act of God. You know, it's <clears> not necessarily your neighbor's fault that a tree fell. Now, if you're able to prove otherwise that they were negligent, like <laughs> they were like, 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 you're backing their truck into it consistently until it fell. Like, okay, well, right. probably a liability claim on the other side of the fence, but that's that's one that's pretty common, right? That what are you are you are you kidding me? It's that's that's my response. I have to pay the deductible. Like that's mm -hmm. his tree. Yeah. yeah, there's one for you, right? Yeah. Um, and I think claims in general, like what's happened the past like ten years in the economy and everything else, has really affected our business in a substantial way. Not just State Farm, but like the other carriers, like it takes longer and is more difficult to do a good thorough job on adjusting for a roof, for instance, right? So what's covered, what's not covered? I don't know. There's, there's a long laundry list of that, but in our area, you know, one of the things that's not covered that is covered in some other areas is foundation repair. You know, that that's a tough one. I was trained up in the Dallas Metroplex to endorse our policy with some extra protection for, Foundation movement caused by leaks. Mm. That's the important part. Yeah. Right. We have the same endorsement down here, but like on in the limestone, <laughs> you know, like our, our soil, like the way that they built track homes, you know, it's just, you could go drive behind my office in some of these neighborhoods and you're going to see six foundation repair companies doing their thing at all times. Yeah. Because we live next to the railroad tracks and we have, you know, no moisture whatsoever for most of the year. Right. Like, yeah. It, it is a breeding ground for foundation issues that are not covered by insurance contracts. So foundation, if it's caused by a leak, is something that you can endorse on pretty much every oh, policy that's out there. Add to it. Yes, okay. but most people don't sell with that on the right. base policy, so you have to add that. But 
that is a in in almost 10 years as an agent i think i've had two or three claims in our area that qualified for that endorsement yeah. and probably another you know 50 or 60 uh, that were filed, that were denied, mine own included, honestly, like I, I had the same issue. <laughs> yeah. And I was pretty sure I was going to play out, but I, you know, I ran it up the flagpole like any other <laughs> consumer for the adjuster to tell me no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that's a big frustration point in our area that is not quite the same, even if you go, you know, up the road to Austin, definitely up the road to Dallas, the, the soil and everything is different about how homes are built in different regions of the state, right? So yeah. in our area, we don't deal with hailstorms all that often, right. but the foundation stuff is unfortunately a, a gap in coverage that you can't really get unless you have a warranty from the sellers, Okay, right? Like a lot of times, and once again, my case too, and I had to sell my house with this transferable warranty because you could like walk in and see, okay, there were some foundation issues here. Um, so most warranty company, or pardon me, most foundation repair companies, they'll do that work and they'll warranty that work for a lifetime. And if you're selling your house, you can transfer that warranty to the buyer. Now the buyer will have to pay you know, a few hundred bucks to transfer it into their name. But if something happens later, they can come back out and work on it regardless of whether they were the first owners or the second owners or whatever. Yeah. Um, I asked you this, uh, and I want to bring it up because it's kind of becoming more of a thing. Uh, solar panels. Yeah. Um, how is that uh, handled with insurance? We we repair solar panels like they're any other shingle. Okay. You don't even really have to add that to the um, um, to the replacement cost of the home. You know what I mean? Now the mechanics and stuff like that. There are some limitations. Now, once again, you can endorse coverage for those types of mechanical repairs if something were to happen but you know thankfully state farm looks at those as any other roof protectant shingle so if it's connected to the house and we can see pictures <laughs> that it was connected to the house right we'll, we'll replace that stuff if it's damaged cool <clears throat> um so speaking of damage uh when when you do claims how does all that work oh. um talk uh, take us through the claim process um how, how speedy is that? Yeah. And um, do they get to hire their own contractors to do the work, et cetera? This is like a huge like training thing for me right now in the <laughs> office. Like we have a we have a new retention specialist who I am making the claim specialist. Like you talk to her if you got a claim going on, right? And training for this type of, you know, training for like claims in general is really difficult because every single claim is different. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. Even like... You, this one rear-ended that person, that person rear-ended that person. Like, yeah. yeah, but the way that that person handled it and the way the other person handled it, <laughs> every single situation is different, right? So, like, how do you train to that, to every situation? Yeah. Different? So I spent a lot of time thinking about the way things used to be and the way they are now and, you know, take the emotion out of it. But the reality is 50% of State Farm's claims adjusters are new. Mm. because of some reorganization we did to save policyholder premium money several years ago. But it's like, you know, pick your poison. You know, we want to give a better price point to our customers. But now we have a completely new staff to handle these claims yeah. if the 30-year vets didn't want to relocate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and uh, um, it's gotten better since 2016, 2017. But we really had to own that process here in the office in spite of the fact that you know, we're not claims adjusters. We're not the final decision maker. But people expect that from their agents, right? Like, hey, I need help with this, right? Yeah. So we've been more proactive about how to handle what has been a much more difficult claims process, right? Um, and, you know, COVID changed everything. Yeah. Like companies figured out other ways to get up on roofs, you know, drones. Um, you know, now we can send out an app for you to take pictures of, like, but like, is that how you want to do it? Right. Mr. Policyholder. Right. So I think, right. you know, what's happened in the past 10 years has made this agency model so much more important, but any, like, how does the claims process work? Let me, let me say this really close to the mic. Call your agent before you do anything. That was very dramatic. Thank you. <laughs> and and I, I mean it in all seriousness. Cause yeah. it's like, like I have customers right now that decided to get something done and send me the receipts. Like State Farm's not going to reimburse you in full for that. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? 
it's how much it costs. The dealership said that. Yeah, the dealership doesn't adhere to our pricing requirements. You know, <laughs> like, like call me and mm -hmm. I can I can direct you and then you can make a decision. You know, you want to use the dealership and they don't adhere to our pricing? That's fine. But you're going to cover the difference. Or you can use one of like these 150 shops in town that will adhere to our pricing. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to get in the middle of it with them, right? Mm -hmm. So whether we're talking about auto insurance or home insurance, call your agent first. Now, back to home insurance. The most common thing is roof damage, right? So what I will tell people when they call me is have, well, I'll ask them, have you gotten a bid for repair? Most of the time it's no on their first call. Cool. I would suggest getting a bid for repair from one or two or three different people so you can see what they think. And then what that does is it, it, it tells you, like they work with us all the time. They know what we'll pay for and what we won't. And a lot of times the roofing contractors will say, yeah, I, think, I don't think you have a total loss here. You know what I mean? This might not cover your deductible. Well, guess what? If, did you know if you file a claim and we don't pay out, they can still use that punitively against you in forecasting claims in the future? Mm. It's cool, right? It's really great. <laughs> so like, call me, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to coach you up, customer. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you not to file a claim, but I can tell you that if the contractor comes back and says, hey, it's going to be $3,000 of repairs and you have a $5,000 deductible, you probably shouldn't file that claim because it's beneath the deductible of damage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So step one, call your agent. Step two, get a bid for repair so you can compare that to your deductible. Mm -hmm. Then file the claim. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Because most people, you know, you have to file a claim within a couple of weeks for, for most situations. But how do you do that with a, with roof damage? Oh, uh, we, we got hail last week, but it's like, I didn't get up there and check it out. And then six months later, I'm getting like moisture, right? Like get the bids and then file the claim. We can mess with the data loss later with storm trackers and stuff like that. Mm. And that's another thing I run into. Now, step one, call your agent. Step two, get a bid for repair, then file the claim. Now, when the claim is filed, that's that's where the process begins in terms of the adjuster coming out, maybe sending a field inspection, getting up on the roof. That, that process can go one of like four different ways now. I normally suggest seeing if you can get your contractor out there at the same time. Not a requirement, but does help if there's some communication between the people licensed to have that discussion, sure. which is not the customer and not the agent, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, that's the next and and probably the last step that takes the longest is getting the contractor and the adjuster on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Call it a negotiation if you want, because the contractors think it, it's going to cost up here, right? The adjuster always think it's going to be right here. <laughs> and the reality is it's somewhere in the middle, but, but the solution is documentation, right? So yeah. when I, when I, uh, I have like these referral sheets, right? Like I, I have to, if I'm going to refer a particular business, I have to send at least three to be compliant, right? So like you know, three real estate agents, three roofing contractors, three body shops, whatever, or more. But I will vet those people out here locally and kick them off my list if I have a bad experience because <laughs> yeah. it's like, I want to know what their process is before I send my customers to use them. Right. That's all I'm, that's all I want. I just want, the integrity of the process to go the way I want it to. And, and really what it is, is documentation. Yeah. Are they going to be thorough? Are they going to work with us? And, you know, some of the adjusters limitations on what they want. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, I have some roofing contractor friends of mine that, you know, they, they may give a big eye roll to something that state farm wants them to do, but they'll do it. And then they got what they wanted yeah, yeah. because you, you, you ran the play that state farm said they wanted you to run. We have, documentation requirements there are regulators from the state that come in unannounced to make sure that we are doing things properly mm. that doesn't necessarily mean saying yes to all your claims right right they want to know that we are executing <clears throat> our contract properly yeah sure huh? that's good to know call so your, call your agent call your agent and they'll tell you what to do pretty much should yeah <laughs> if you have a good agent if, if you don't not, have a good agent this is austin riley you can call me <laughs> call this guy and, and, and I do that, right? Like, like, you know, I don't, I don't know if you have your friends and family and your personal network that call you for like real estate advice, but they don't actually use you for like real estate business. You know, it's like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. call me. I will actually 
give you advice <laughs> without checking my book of business. Are you a customer? Like, no, like, no you, we can't talk about this, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like, it's all good. Once right. again, people helping people, you do yeah. the right thing, good things come back your way. So Absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't even try to sell you if you don't want to be sold. You, know, you just call me for <laughs> advice. Well, cool. Um, we're going to we're going to wrap this up with kind of the elephant in the room of yeah. going. Okay, why are insurance rates just going crazy right now? I mean, then again, everything in the whole economy is going crazy, right? Yeah. So we wanted to talk about this. Um, it's kind of a negative, but talk about talk about it and bring us to reality of like, hey, what's going on? Yeah. So in a society that runs off of capitalism, the consumer is going to pay for the inflationary pressure. Um, and that's what's happening, right? So all the same reasons that everything else is getting more expensive. Um, but with something more specific as it pertains to insurance, like let's talk about cars. Like I think that's where you see the worst insurance rate hikes because traditionally cars don't appreciate in value mm -hmm. like they have like the past four years. Yeah. Like think about it. Like have you ever seen the value of your car go up? Like, okay, that's going to affect what it costs to protect said car from damage and repair and, and um, you know, bodily injury, healthcare costs have gone up, you know? Like, so if you look at car insurance, right, the cost of claims has spiked in individual claim, average claim costs, but the volume of claims has continued to go up. Mm. You know, right, the texting and driving and all of that. Like, this is why you see every insurance carrier investing money in what's called telematics. Telematics would be the drive safe and save, progressive snapshot, um, USAA has a version of it, all state drive wise. Like there's a few versions of it out there, but it's all the umbrella under telematics. It's essentially driving data. Like how safe are you at driving? Like maybe someday in the future we could assign auto insurance rates to that, you know, like mm. what a novel thought, but you know, technology is just now getting to the point where we could do that. Um, and so like, like the insurance carriers work at <laughs> bringing our claims costs down by, like these like drive safe promotions, right? Right. Um, a little bit of individual accountability would go a long way with our industry. You know, people cause less accidents, more responsible behind the wheel. These insurance rates will go down. They will for State Farm because we're mutual. Okay. So Geico and Progressive are shareholder companies. Uh, Warren Buffett owns Geico. Um, you know, they're in it for their shareholders. Sure. Okay. State Farm is a mutual company, meaning we're in it for our policyholders. Okay. We paid a dividend out during COVID because we were a mutual company. So every auto insurance policyholder in America that was part of our mutual program got a dividend. Mm. Okay. So, you know, when it pertains, like when you're talking about inflationary pressures, that's the, that's what's happening to the entire industry. Okay. It doesn't matter what their balance sheets look like or how they do what they do. Everyone's suffering through that. Okay. That's, that's the consumer side of the fence. Now there are some pretty specific things that are going on with regards to the insurance business. Like, so if you have a giant hurricane or a wildfire in California or, uh, you know, 10 hailstorms in one year, right. We categorize those in like, like how many times every 250 years, every 500 years. I mean, there are a thousand year events, right? So insurance carriers are just like consumers in the sense that if one of those events happens, they have insurance <laughs> to pay out the claims that they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise because we're not collecting enough in premium to cover for such a wide, vast, expensive event like that that may roll through a region, right? And now you're getting these types of storms every year. So what's happened over the past five years is the insurance carriers that sell reinsurance have been like every other insurance. They've, they've spiked their rates and some of them aren't profitable. So they've stopped selling it. Like wh where are you supposed to go to get this stuff? Right. Yeah. And we're talking about like, like, like hundred million dollar type things, you know what I mean? Billions of dollars. Uh, and the premiums that go with that type of protection are extravagant. So, if you have to have this product and now they've marked it up 80%, yeah. who pays for that? And now everyone's starting to see, oh, well, that's why my rates are good. They're rolling it down to me. It's like, yeah, now the cost of doing business 
has gone up significantly, not just from all of like the organic inflationary pressure we were talking about, but from a very specific thing. <laughs> the reinsurance carriers went up on their rates and or aren't selling it to some of these carriers based on their claims performance. Right. Right. And so this is why, like, you know, I, I tell people it's it really stinks that our rates have gone up 40 percent. But some of the carriers across the street have gone up double that, triple that. Mm. Some of them aren't even riding here in Texas because they can't buy the reinsurance. Right. So State Farm buys the majority of its reinsurance from itself. And so we can insulate a little bit better from that stuff. It, you know, it, it helps that we're 101 years old. Mm. You know, the other carriers aren't aren't that old or as big and strong and our investment portfolio has been chugging along on you know, high interest rates and CDs and T bills and T notes. Like all of that stuff is how we make money and grow the organization so that we can take losses on the actual business. Right. So we don't have to jack up premiums to cover all the claims. Just, just we got to get closer to profitability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that's what I spend the majority of my time talking about every day now is, mm -hmm. I've been a customer for, you know, 20 plus years, 10 plus years. I've been a customer for six months. Why are my rates going up? Doesn't matter. Everyone's like, you told me it was going to be this. <laughs> six months later, now it's like 25% more than that. Like, what gives? Right. It's like, I hear you. It's not you. It's me. Right? It's like, <laughs> it's not you. It's, 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 not, it's not anything but inflationary pressure. You're great, but we have to figure out how to price this product correctly and we're massaging it in, in bite-sized chunks. Right. You know, I, I tell people, pick your poison. You want a 40% rate increase in one fell swoop, or do you want us to break it up over three different 15% rate increases? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we just give it all at once. I don't know. Like, but, it, <laughs> but we got to pick a lane. Right. And so this is what State Farm has decided to do here in Texas, specifically. Every state's a little bit different with how they handle that. But the inflation is global. Right. Like, you, know, you know, those reinsurance things, like, some of those carriers aren't even in the United States. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. this is something that is happening across the globe and we're all trying to figure it out so we can keep our customers happy. <laughs> uh, is it going to go back down? I don't know. Our interest rates going to go back up, <laughs> back up. Uh, You're like back up. Like, cause you and I are of an age, <laughs> right? Like we're like, yeah, 2% is the standard. Yeah. <laughs> My mom and dad were like, dude, we had like a 16% second mortgage on our interest rate. And like, that's what people were used to. <laughs> right. You know? So yeah. like, yeah. so yeah, are they going to go back up more? You know, yeah. if so, I, I think if interest rates go up, you're going to see insurance carriers make more money on their bond portfolios. If we're making more money on our bond portfolios, you can see us funnel that into savings on the product. Mm. Um, I don't think rates are going to go back down, but I think they're going to stabilize yeah. going in the next year. And that's, that's been what we've seen and what we're projecting going into next year right. um, is a more stable rate. Now, are we going to stop seeing increases altogether? Probably not. You know, I, I saw in the news that the Fed may raise rates again. Yeah. And they probably should, dude. Like, oh, no one's going to vote for me when I start <laughs> saying things like that. But, but you know, like, like I can get into more macro stuff like Social Security, right? Did you know that Social Security was a long-term care program back in World War II when it started? Because life expectancy was less than the year when you started taking out Social Security. Right. I guess that's, that's yeah. what we call long-term care. That is not a retirement product, right? Right. So how do you fund Social Security when people are drawing off it for 20 years? Right. Before they get to life expectancy, like you wonder why there's a math problem in America. You know what I mean? Like, like, like we're not even talking about like construction, education, all these other public funded things, government funded things um, that go into what we pay in taxes. Right. But like we're at pretty historically low taxes right now too. You go back to after the great depression and world war two and taxes were a lot higher back mm. then. It's a golden age. Right. But could you imagine like, like getting, like taking things back to that level? If we did though, there would be more individual accountability from person to person. You know what I mean? You know mm -hmm. that like there aren't no handouts out there. You gotta, you, you gotta carry your own weight. Right. So, you know, I'll spare you all the politics, but I, I, I think as consumers, we do have a responsibility to fix this stuff, right? All of us, you know, pay your premiums and drive safe, you know, don't text and drive. It, yeah. It's as simple as that. You know, if your roofer offers to like inflate the bid, 
so you don't have to pay your deductible. One, that's fraud. So you're dealing with someone who's comfortable with fraud. Um, and, and two, that inflates our cost of repairs. Right. You talk to someone down the street in 10 seconds, they're like, yeah, that's how it was done, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, when you were committing fraud, right? right? Like, it's just like, that's what drives the costs up. So I, I think if people do the right thing, that will help Yeah, to right. some extent. Well, cool, man. I don't Dude. know. That, that might be like not so fun to hear from some people. You know what I mean? But like, like being on the other end of some of those conversations, like, yeah. oh, dude, like this is, this is a thing you got to do. You got to do the right thing out there and right. better things happen. Yeah. True. Well, cool, man. There's my soapbox. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed all of it. There was a <laughs> lot in there. Um, so you need to call this guy. <laughs> if you have any insurance questions, you know, hopefully you got some information from this podcast that Maybe. you can share with somebody. Um, go back, listen to it, do it again. Yeah. But call this guy. Um, he's your insurance guy. So if you need anything, I highly recommend him. He's a brilliant man, <laughs> has a great business, and likes Legos. Uh, you know? like a lot, and, and, yeah. and he's fun. You know, he's a fun guy. Yeah, goes first, go. Okay, I'm not sure if that's compliant. but yeah. um, and, and if you need to reach out to me and you don't feel comfortable calling, um, I'm pretty OCD about my email. Okay. Pretty OCD about my email. So you can email me at Austin at Austin Riley SF agent.com. You see what I did there with the SF? Yeah. yeah. It stands for state farm. So SF agent Austin at Austin Riley SF agent.com. Also, if you uh, are more comfortable texting, you know, you want to, you want to reach out to us that way. Not while driving. Don't Not do while, while driving, driving, man. Voice command all the way. <laughs> yeah. Bluetooth. Yeah. Uh, don't mess with my discount. Um, <laughs> You can text my office number now. That's okay. like a relatively new thing. It's like everyone else has been texting for like 20 <laughs> years. It's like, we just got it. Woo! <laughs> but you can text my office at 210-514-1120. We can, we can answer any questions that you have, or I can tell you I don't know, and we'll research those answers, and then yeah. I'll, I'll know more the next day, right? Next cool. time we do a podcast. And you, and you uh, have social media stuff Yes. As well? uh, I know on, you do like Tuesdays uh, stuff, right? I, I've been transitioning away from that. I okay. kind of got burned out on yeah, the yeah, Tuesday yeah. tips and stuff. We'll yeah, probably yeah. regurgitate some of that. But sure. um, now we're running a uh, an Austin's Friday Finds. Okay. So if you're a small business owner in the area and you'd like some love on the social media platform and access to my audience, yeah. um, I am looking for small business owners to feature, hint, hint, yeah. wink, wink, in the area on uh, Austin's Friday Finds. So cool. we do a little bit of that on Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. We do yeah. a lot more business networking there on that site. Um, yeah, we're, we're playing in the digital space, man. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. Well, cool, man. I really appreciate you coming on the show. You got it. Thanks for coming out and doing it on my home tour. Yeah. Man, show I, off my Legos. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, share with a friend. Get this information out to somebody that could use it. Uh, leave us a review. Give us a rating. That really helps us grow the show as well. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And we thank you for joining us today. Now let's get out there and go produce. Peace.